out in the garden, Pete Lawrence, who waited for us, to show us a supernova remnant. So, out to Pete. The Crab Nebula is a spectacular supernova remnant in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. If you look at a professional image of the crab, it looks absolutely amazing. Bright filaments and vivid colours. But what can you see if you only have an amateur average size telescope? Well, let's start by finding the crab. In fact, it's quite a simple thing to locate in the night sky. If you go out on a November evening and look towards the east or the southeast, say at around 9.30, you'll see the magnificent pattern of Orion the Hunter rising. If you can locate Orion, locate the three stars in the centre of the pattern, which form his famous belt, and extend them up and to the right, you come to a bright, slightly orange-hued star, which is known as Aldebaran, the brightest star in Taurus the Bull. Next to Aldebaran is a V-shaped cluster of stars, which is known as the Hyades. Now, if you extend the arms of the Hyades across to the left, you eventually come to two third magnitude stars which mark the tips of the bull's horns. And it's the bottom or southern tip which is marked by the star Zeta Tauri which is the key to locating the Crab Nebula. If you look at this area by centering Zeta Tauri in a pair of binoculars or through the finder scope on your telescope, you'll see that there is a pattern of stars. Zeta Tauri, fairly bright at the bottom, and then three other fainter ones. They form, if you like, a squashed kite shaped in the sky. And the key to finding the crab is to use the one on the left, join it to the one at the top, and then extend the line again for about half the distance again. If you do this, you'll be pointing exactly at where the crab nebula is in the sky. Well, through binoculars, it is possible to see it, but it is quite difficult, and you need very clear dark skies to succeed. And it looks like a faint dot, faint fuzzy extended dot. A small telescope will improve the view, and you can see it as a slightly extended patch of light. Say a four inch or a six inch telescope will reveal that the patch of light isn't evenly illuminated, it's slightly mottled. If you want to see the incredible detail which is in the nebula, you have to go to a much larger telescope, say a 16 inch. So what is the Crab Nebula, and where has it come from? Well, the Crab Nebula is a supernova, or is the remnant of a supernova explosion, which was observed about a thousand years ago. The Chinese and Arabian astronomers of the day observed a new star in the night sky. In fact, this was no ordinary star. It was incredibly bright compared to the average stars that they could see. It was estimated to be about magnitude minus six, which makes it four times brighter than Venus. In fact, it was so bright that it could be viewed during the day, and it was observed for 23 days consecutively in broad daylight. In 1844, the Earl of Ross, using his huge 72-inch reflecting telescope, known as the Leviathan of Parsonstown, observed it and sketched it. And his sketch resembled a crab, and that's where it got its nickname from, the Crab Nebula, the name we know it by today. Pete, thank you very much. And now, back to Phoenix on the surface of Mars. Chris Seminova in Arizona to bring us the latest news. If I want to find out how this magnificent desert landscape formed, I can study the rocks that make up the mountains. I can pick up soil and look at how it behaves. If I want to do the same for the vast northern plains of Mars, I have to go there. And that's what the Phoenix spacecraft has done. Phoenix is NASA's latest mission to Mars. It landed last May in the Martian Arctic Circle. Its mission is to scratch and then sniff the surface of Mars, looking at the soil under the microscope and testing its chemistry and its composition. It does this by digging into the soil carefully choosing samples for its suite of miniature laboratory instruments. Phoenix Mission Control is here in Tucson. The sky at night last visited in June, when Phoenix had been on Mars for a month. The whole place was buzzing with scientists dashing to get a hold of the latest results and the latest images, and then arguing over them. 
Yeah. Oh, there we are. Oh, that's a steep back wall, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And that really did go. That really did dig in at the at the front there. A hundred days have passed on Mars since I was last here, and things have changed somewhat. What was a bustling control center has become an oasis of calm. But meanwhile, on the red planet, Phoenix still has work to do. Mars has become a harsher place since then, too. The long days of an Arctic summer are gone, and now Phoenix has to endure the onset of the Martian winter. Early mid sequence initiated. Peter Smith has led the mission since its conception six years ago, and it's been quite a journey. Well, how's Phoenix? Phoenix is doing well, and I'm a little bit surprised it's beyond its warranty. Its warranty was three months. We didn't expect it to die after three months, but it's gone on and on, and the spacecraft shows no sign of any aging. So we think it's there all the way to the end when winter sets in. Let's start with talking about the weather, seeing as you mentioned it. We've seen clouds in the sky now, even snow we hear. Well, it's getting a little blustery, you know. It's a fall weather. Uh, there's uh, um, frost on the pumpkin, so to speak. And <laughs> it's known from orbital missions that polar weather is a lot more exciting than equatorial weather. And you can see cyclonic uh, wind patterns developing and whipping across the northern plains. We've actually seen uh, low pressure cells move by. And uh, the winds increase, the winds twisting around as, as uh, weather patterns come past us. And then just recently, we've seen streamers under the clouds with our laser experiment. And this is indicative of snow. Now, the snow doesn't always get down to the surface. And remember, Mars' atmosphere is very thin. So the snow tends to uh, sublimate before it reaches the ground or may come down as this little sparkling dust, what we call diamond dust and uh, we're starting to observe that sort of effect. That means we're headed towards the cold season, the winter season of the polar plains of Mars. You mentioned Phoenix is now entering winter. How bad is it going to get? Well, the temperature's been dropping. Uh, during the summer, the high temperature in the warmest part of day was maybe minus 20 degrees centigrade. Now it's down minus 30, minus 35, and the nights are getting very cold. It could be minus uh, 100, 110 and it's headed down to minus 130. That'll be the temperature throughout the entire day in the winter, minus 130. We have this wonderful view of the landing site. What have you seen and, and what did you expect? Well, it's similar to what we expected from the pictures from orbit. It's a landscape that's modeled by uh, the expansion and contraction of ice. And this happens through the seasons, and uh, the ice tends to buckle under those pressures. And so we see a surface that ripples out towards the horizon. And uh, these are called polygonal or pattern ground features. And, and uh, we are fortunate enough, and this is where we didn't expect this to happen, is that we can actually reach to the center and to the troughs between these uh, mounded features on the, on the terrain. So we look at uh, two different types of landform, and we're digging right now down to the surface, and we're gonna expose ice across uh, one of these hillocks and through the trough, and that'll tell us a lot about how ice forms in these plains. We keep talking about ice. Can we be absolutely sure it's water ice? We are positive. We have actually scraped up some chunks and put it into our TIGA instrument, which has a mass spectrometer, so we can boil off the the water from the ice and actually measure the mass of the individual uh, particles. And of course, it's oxygen plus two hydrogens, mass of 18, we see it directly. Some four billion years ago, Mars was a planet covered in water. And it's the presence of that water, albeit locked up in ice beneath the surface, that drew the Phoenix team to this part of Mars. Previous missions, like the rovers Spirit and Opportunity, have found evidence of minerals that can only have formed in the presence of liquid water. Their results suggested that the ancient seas of Mars were acidic, and so Phoenix's team were expecting more of the same from their part of Mars. Instead of acids, though, they found alkaline soil. We have, of course, read the 